Welcome to another episode of Keeping It Real, the largest podcast made by real estate agents and for real estate agents. My name is DJ Paris. I am your host and guide through the show. And today we have another episode of our monthly series, Closing Time, with Chris Linzel of theclose.com. Uh, now, this is a partnership with theclose.com. And let me tell you a little bit about their website, which is specifically for real estate professionals. Now, The Close is a new kind of real estate website designed to give agents, teams, and brokerages actionable strategic insight from industry professionals. Now, they cover real estate marketing, lead generation, technology, and team building strategies from the perspective of working agents and brokers who want to take their business to the next level. Now, please visit theclose.com. That's T-H-E-C-L-O-E.com and subscribe to their newsletter so you can be notified every time they publish an article. They are our favorite uh, uh, you know, web website, uh, real estate website blog specifically designed to help agents. Um, we're super thrilled to have them. And today we have Chris Linsell. Um, and let me tell you about Chris. Uh, Chris is the Close's resident expert on real estate topics ranging from marketing, lead generation, transactional best practices, and of course, everything in between. Now, he's also a licensed agent in the state of Michigan. Uh, Chris has been part of hundreds of transactions from modest rural starter homes to massive waterside compounds. Now, when he isn't writing, you'll find Chris or servicing his clients, uh, you'll find Chris fly fishing the trout streams of Michigan or at, on the stage in his community theater's latest production. Um, Chris, uh, welcome once again to the show. DJ, so glad to be back. Thanks for having me. So I have to ask uh, about um, community theater. Are, yeah. are, 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 you, are people doing any virtual theater? Um, you know, here in Chicago, we have arguably, some, some say the best theater in the entire mm -hmm. country or certainly right up there. Mm -hmm. uh, we have great, great places like the Steppenwolf and, and the Goodman uh, and, and lots of other um, uh, theaters. But um, are there productions going on that you're, that you're working with or is everyone kind of waiting? Everyone's pretty hunkered down here. Uh, nothing that I'm involved in, though. I have seen a couple of people uh, from our local community group uh, starting to develop uh, things like like Zoom uh, productions, where they're literally sure. doing um, uh, doing improv via Zoom. We've got a couple of really great entertainers who are doing uh, uh, magic and comedy shows via Zoom. Uh, which are actually getting really popular. So, you know, Ooh. I'm not, I'm definitely not uh, a, a participator at the moment, but I'm definitely a supporter of people who are finding new ways to express that art. Yeah, it's fun to watch some of some artists who are, who are still creating. Like I noticed that if you remember, um, MTV had a series in the 90s called The State. It was a, a comedy oh, yeah. troupe from, from the East Coast and they have all reunited and are making sketches uh, based on filming things at home and then kind of piecing it all together. And, and it, it actually is, is, is pretty funny. Um, Absolutely. And, and someone also just, uh, Jason Reitman, um, uh, the famous director, just reshot The Princess Bride with all uh, various like 50 different actors. And oh. they, they cobbled it together. I don't think it's officially out yet, but I was watching that. And there's like you know, five different uh, people playing the same parts, um, uh, which is going to be really cool to watch. And it's going to be all dissonant because, of course, the backgrounds and everything are, are, are unique. And so I'm very excited to see what, what uh, the theater community and the, and the you know, sort of uh, entertainment community is doing uh, during this time. Huge. Yeah, I've got a friend who's working on a series, uh, like an episodic uh, kind of story of uh, somebody's... Um, first job they got their first job uh two days before everybody went into lockdown and so oh, it's no. like the story of uh it's like a fictional uh comedic telling of this person's first um foray into the professional world uh you know uh, and, and having to do the entire thing via zoom it's a really funny <laughs> funny way that of telling funny. the story yeah so anyway uh yeah lots happening lots happening yeah, a lot, a lot is happening. So I wanted to, to quickly, two things. Uh, first, I want to talk about The Close before we get into our topics for the day. The Close has a, a new program 
for uh, for their their viewers, uh, for their fans, called the Close Pro. And I was hoping you could walk us through what that is and, and how it works. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in a nutshell, here's, here's the way the Close Pro works. Um, and I'll back up by saying the Close is a completely free, uh, 100% open uh, real estate resource for agents and brokers to better your business. We want to provide fantastic content uh, as often as possible that are gonna that's gonna up your game. Um, but we have found through talking to readers uh, and being a part of this business that that we've got folks who are looking for more, and that's where the Close Pro comes in. Close Pro is a subscription, a monthly subscription service. It's thirty five bucks a month, and with the Close Pro. Not only do you get access to all of our article content like everybody else, but you also get exclusive access to um, premium courses that we've written, uh, including six simple systems to transform your real as well as a course called Thrive, uh, Survive and Thrive in a Changing Market. You get access to small group coaching every week, and you get access to our resource library with a ton of templates and uh, scripts and guides, long form guides that you can download and use in your business. So it's just a way to take your business uh, to that next level. Um, we really hope that everyone is getting uh, tons of great strategy and advice out of theclose.com. And for those agents who are ready to accelerate their business, the Close Pro is a great option to do that. Yeah. And so how you, and by the way, there's a 14 day free trial as well. So mm -hmm. it's certainly something that you can, you can test, see how, it, how it appeals to you and then continue on. It, it, the close is an amazing resource. So I'm really excited. there now having uh, this additional um, uh, subscription option for, uh, for their fans. So definitely check it out. Just go to the close.com. You'll see uh, in the menu bar at the top, the close pro, I think it's also somewhere else on their homepage, but seek it out. It's, it's worth checking out and 14 day free trial. So nothing, to lose. Um, Absolutely. Wonderful. Now, I wanted to also touch on this is about a week old at the time of us recording. So today is actually the 2nd of July. This happened actually back uh, towards the end of June, June 25th, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I just so it's so topical and um, something I thought we, we should just at least address and, and you know, discuss, uh, which is that the Houston, Associ uh, Houston Association of Realtors, and I, th I could be wrong, I believe they might be the first association to have made this shift, has removed uh, the word master um, it w with respect to being a bedroom descriptor. Um, that, that, is, that, that word is, is gone. They believe it has ties to, um, you know, slave ownership and figured that word was problematic and has now been replaced by the word primary. So um, no longer will the term master be allowed uh, in the Houston uh, Association of Realtors. And I, I'm curious to see if, if that trend continues to spread to other uh, local associations or even if the National Association of Realtors might even uh, have, a, have a statement about that. Um, so just uh, wanted to bring that up as, as something that's very topical. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I, I mean, here's, here's something to kind of just consider about this. The term master bedroom um, or master bathroom, you know, we looking back at, at the way that that word um, or that phrase came about in the kind of nomenclature of the real estate business, nobody has been able to point specifically to a particular source where it came from. Sure. There's not like a clearly uh, drawn line between uh, today and, um, you know, slave owner era um, homes. There's no, there's no direct line there, but th that's really not the point here. The point here sure. is that that term has the opportunity to be interpreted as hurtful or as um, as as applicable towards uh, you know these times in our country where there really was a master of the house who owned slaves and so I personally I applaud the Houston Association of Realtors for making this change in part because it's the right thing to do it's good to be on the right side of history and also because they recognized like we should all recognize that there's no downside here. There's no downside to removing this term from the way that we talk about property and listings. There's only upside. This is only gonna benefit um, the people who are using these services in our community. So I really am glad that they took a look, did the math on this and said, we wanna be on the right side here. 
And this isn't hurting anybody to make this change. It's only helping. Yeah, I, I agree fully with you uh, with that thought. And, you know, it's interesting, too, because now we're starting to, as, as a society and, and hopefully as, as a globally, starting to look at language and, and understanding its impact that seemingly uh, may, maybe to, to uh, you know, someone who's not currently dealing with racial issues in their own personal life, um, we, we often overlook and forget. So in the IT world, the word master and slave are, are very, well, they're not used as much anymore, but they were used very commonly to describe, you know, uh, hardware components. There'd be a slave drive and a master drive. Mm -hmm. And it was used, and there's, there's all sorts of uh, designations that are called, I'm a master X, you know, I might be a, a master chef or a master there. Are, and, and so we're starting to look at all of these phrases and say, okay, is it time to retire these phrases? Do they harken back to days that we aren't uh, wanting to, to associate with? And again, to your point, does this actually hurt anything to change? And in this case, master bedroom to primary bedroom, I would say personally doesn't seem to hurt anything, uh, seems to only help easy shift and you know, no, 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 no blood uh, drawn as a result of it. Um, so I'm, I also applaud them and, and hope that uh, this seems like a real simple and easy shift. Um, but, you know, we were talking, Chris and I were talking offline. There's other, there's other language that hasn't, you know, yet been, been fully uh, understood. But, mm -hmm. but in that same vein, I, our managing broker here at our office, whenever he sees uh, one of our agents listings, if, if they use the word just a few steps away in, in a description, so the property is just a few steps away, he, he, has a, he will make sure that's removed because not everyone's mobile, not everyone can walk. Not everyone can walk up steps, even though that's not really what that's referencing. Um, but it is referencing mobility. Um, and that is something that not all of us have. And so to, to think about, you know, I think this is a great opportunity to us just to reflect upon the language we use and how we speak to clients, um, the language we use when we're posting our, our, our inventory online. Um, you know, how are we describing these? Are we trying to be inclusive? And is there any language even if it's benign and, and not ill-intended, is there a language here to consider uh, adjusting to, to be more inclusive? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, personally, I'll, I'll just kind of bare my soul here a little bit. Personally, I have not ever been uh, on the negative end of any kind of what feels like discrimination or housing discrimination. That's never an experience that I've personally had. And so, you know, I can't necessarily identify with how it would feel to be in that position. Sure. But what I can, what I can do is, is I can say to myself, okay, so what, what um, challenge, what, what work do I have to do personally in order to remove those roadblocks for other people. And, you know, I'll be the first to say, yeah, we've got to be thoughtful about the words that we choose. And for some folks, that's annoying or frustrating. But I guess I would just put it to you like this. You, nobody is asking you personally to change the way that you're thinking. They're asking the way, you know, we're, we're, the, the ask is to consider changing the way that you're acting. Um, and remember, this is this is your profession this is your community these are these are the the words that you're choosing have an effect on your professionalism on your career and on the industry as a whole and so why not err on the side of progress rather than uh erring on the side of hesitance because you know, it's just the way we've always done it. it just doesn't, the, the math just doesn't add up for me there. Right. And, and ultimately too, you are running a business and you want as a real estate professional, it's your business or you're on a, uh, you work for a team or you work for a firm. Um, but either so, this is your business. And, you know, it, 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 from a business perspective, you want to make sure that people aren't uh, feeling uh, ostracized or discriminated upon uh, this will only, of course, ultimately help your business too, which isn't the reason to make the shift, but you want to run a successful business, which means you want to avoid any, any sort of challenging uh, language that, that might uh, not only, you know, 
you know, result in, in issues around your licensing, but also just as being a good citizen of, of, of the country, you want to be inclusive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what changes are coming um, because I had never thought of the term master bedroom. Uh, I, I hadn't thought of that because again, it, like you had said, I, I have not been, to my knowledge, uh, the recipient of, of any sort of housing discrimination. Mm -hmm. But I suspect to those who have, obviously the, you know, that term might be a, a lot more sensitive yeah. and again, easy change. Easy um, change. Yeah. 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 And you know, even, even uh, Vince Malta, who's the, the uh, head of the uh, national association of realtors yeah. said something along the lines of, you know, we, we, we get that um, HUD and, uh, and, and the NAR uh, don't, you know, can't find any kind of historical connection to these words, but if the use of the terminology is offensive to some people we would you know we we encourage people to make the decision that makes sense for them and for their market uh and to be on the right side of history essentially so you know i think i think the momentum towards positive change exists and just we just need to get on board with it yeah. Now, moving on, I also um, we wanted to talk about, and, and unfortunately, you know, in the news right now, uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, who has been discussing recently um, that there may be this the second surge coming. We're seeing some troubling stats, specifically in in a couple of states, Florida and and uh, Texas. Although in a lot of states, in fact, as of about a week ago, I think there were only two states with declining numbers, but Florida and, and Texas have have jumped uh, unfortunately higher than than other states. So he's been warning of possible second surge, also mm -hmm. flu season's coming. Um, so there's a lot going on that, that unfortunately might, uh, might sort of uh, merge into a, you know, a second wave that, yeah. that is, uh, is problematic. Um, what are your thoughts on, on kind of what we could start doing as real estate agents to, to prep, we would say prep for the worst um, yeah. if this does, if we do get a second wave? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so first of all, I would say, um, it's not what we can do right now. It's what you absolutely need to do. Everybody needs to be doing this right now. And I'll use an example of the last time I went to the grocery store, which was a couple of days ago, uh, before I left, my wife said, start getting some stuff. And I knew exactly what she meant. I knew mm -hmm. exactly what she meant because, you know, things in Michigan are okay. Uh, we're experiencing kind of an uptick in cases uh, here, but not as bad in other places, but you know, it's pretty clear the chances of things uh, of, of us having to go back into a lockdown of businesses shutting down of us not having the ability to, you know, move as freely, the chances of that happening again, pretty high. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to say they're, you know, more than 50, 50, but who knows? I'm not a doctor. I, I really don't know that. And so if you as a real estate agent are not uh, and I'm using air quotes here if you're just listening to this. If you're not getting stuff, as my wife says, <laughs> you are crazy right now. And yeah. here's what I mean by getting stuff. Think about all the things that you wish you would have done. Yeah, the first time. Yeah. Your business at the end of February. Right. You would have gotten, if, if, if you could go back in a time machine, you would have gotten a great video tour for every single one of your listings. You yeah. would have put in place protocols for virtual tours um, and partnered maybe even with your property owners um, to conduct virtual tours uh, you know, with their cell phones if, if uh, really necessary. You would have put into place uh, all sorts of systems that would allow you to um, have contactless communication with title companies, with lenders, with inspectors, with appraisers, all of the people that are required to make your business run. And guess what? Right now, at least, you know, for most markets, we don't have to have all that stuff because restrictions have been loosened. Right. But you know what? If we move back to where we were in March and you don't have those systems in place you are going to get blown away by all the people who are right now getting their stuff. They're getting this stuff together right now. So there's, there's a lot we can talk about here, but that's just kind of the top, you know, the top line of advice here is put yourself back into your shoes end of February, beginning of March. And all of the things you said, Oh man, what am I going to do without X, Y, and Z? 
you better be making a plan for every single one of those right now. And we can talk more specifically about individual stuff, but that's the top line advice. Get in your time machine, go back, start getting your stuff together. And also think about the connections that you may have missed or that you, you know, we, we were all dealing with so much uncertainty, fear, stress, a lot of job loss, um, a lot of just people feeling disconnected from other humans due to us being, you know, locked in, in, in our homes, essentially. Uh, and if that were to revert back, which seemingly it, it could and, and maybe will, um, this is a great opportunity to say, okay, did I, did I do a great job of connecting with my clients mm -hmm. while we were going through this? Or, you know, doing sort of a hard line look of, or maybe I didn't, maybe I really didn't uh, reach out as much as I, as I ought to have. Well, now you can start to prepare to say, okay, which you probably should be reaching out at all times anyway, but creating a structure saying, okay, well, if this does happen. People are going to, we know what's going to happen. People are going, so as far as we don't know what's going to happen, but we know how people are going to feel. They're going to mm -hmm. be scared about their jobs. They're going to be, uh, they're going to feel lonely and disconnected um, and they're going to be frustrated and stressed. Yep. So as an agent, are there things I can do to help uh, my, my, my clients, my prospective clients, um, you know, deal with that more effectively. And now is a good time to get some stuff. If you want, you know, you could, you could do a little care package. You could just make sure everyone's, you know, going to get a phone call, uh, you know, at a certain amount of time. Those are all things we can easily start to set up and do, uh, so that we can be prepared to support those, those, uh, those clients. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the other interesting thing too, that I think, uh, listeners should be considering right now is back the first time we went through a lockdown and a quarantine, it was literally, I mean, I remember in my business and in my family life, it was, a, it was uncharted territory every single day. We just, we didn't know what the next day was going to look like. We didn't know how the market was going to react. We didn't know how our industry was going to react. Well, we have some learnings now, relatively small uh, batch of data, but we have a little bit of understanding of what our local markets, what our, our more macro markets are going to, how they may react if we go back into like a, a shutdown uh, mode as, as an economy. And so this is an opportunity for real estate agents to look back at the historical data that they have, even if it's just a few months old and say, okay, if this happens again, how can I use the expectations for what may happen again to my advantage? And I'll give you an example of this. Great. Um, recently uh, on the close, I want to say just not even a week ago or so, um, one of our contributors, uh, Sean Modry, published an article. It's nine proven strategies to find hidden listing, li excuse yeah. me, hidden listing inventory in 2020. And I know for me in my local market, one of the relatively unexpected, but now very consistent things that has happened as a result of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, is the already short levels of inventory have gotten even shorter. Yes. And people are just are hesitant to list their property for sale, but it has not slowed down the, the hunger of buyers, especially in certain uh, sectors of the market. And so agents who can be um, strategic and thoughtful and get ahead of the game when it comes to developing listing inventory, those agents are going to be more successful and are going to actually accelerate their business especially through another lockdown phase because there is going we're going to come down on the other side of that lockdown phase you're going to have 50 percent more inventory than you typically would and you're going to close all of those sales because we've got people hungry for those for those purchases right now um, we just don't have the inventory to sell so Check out that article on the close if you're interested in that. Nine proven strategies to find hidden listing inventory in 2020. And that's one thing I know I personally am going to be focusing on. If we end up moving into another lockdown phase, I'm going to be looking specifically at developing inventory um, with the idea of, of uh, you know, moving it uh, as soon as people can get back into homes. And I have, th thank you. That, that, and that was a great article. I did see that. Uh, so right now, all of us are 
or at least here in the Chicago area and Chris's area of Michigan, um, it, where he is, he's experiencing a shortage in inventory. We're, we're seeing that too. And everyone I've talking to from all the uh, top producers we interview on the show are saying the same thing. So this is a great article to, to start to understand what else might be out there outside of what you're seeing on the MLS. And I also have another suggestion. Um, if you have listings right now, and, and maybe if you feel they they, they aren't going to close right away, um, which hopefully they will due to uh, lending rates being inexpensive, you know, obviously uh, not as much inventory being available. But if you suspect that, that your, uh, some of these listings may, may go into the fall um, before they're sold, and if that's when you know, the CDC may be projecting some of these unfortunate, um, you know, increase in, in, in cases, um, your clients are going to be asking, hey, what happens if we go back into lockdown? And what happens mm -hmm. to my listing? And, and how does that affect uh, buyer trends? And how are we going to do showings? And, and you need to have an answer. And, and yeah. so the good news is, you know, some of the procedural stuff is pretty easy because you went through it last time. But what you really should be able to say is, here's, let me sh actually show you what happened to listings when, when the lockdown, you know, sort of went into effect. And, and here's how it affected their time on market. And here's how it affected, you know, buyer trends. And you need to have that answer because they're going to be wondering that. I know if I was getting ready to list a property, I would be asking my agent, Hey, just, just in case, what happens if we all get locked down again? And if you're kind of like, well, we'll see if day by day, nobody really knows. I don't feel like that's, a, that's the strongest answer. So what you can do and what I'd recommend is probably all of our listeners are paying local association dues, state association dues, national association dues. We're all paying these, these you know, sizable amounts of money to be part of these organizations. Um, you can reach out, specifically start with your local association and say, hey, I just want to have a, a, a really you know, intelligent answer and an educated answer with some data about how my clients are, are I'm, you know, I suspect they're going to start asking about this. Obviously, hopefully your firm would be able to provide some guidance. But if not, c contact your local association and say, how do I run some reports just to see what actually happened during that time in case we're going into a second wave because I want to make sure my clients have a have an understanding of what might be coming um and boy you will look like a superstar if you if you have that oh, yeah. information absolutely yeah huge i mean there that's the other thing that i think real estate agents should be thinking about uh right now is there was established uh in the last um you know six months of four months here there has been an established uh expectation for um the uh, professionals in your community that are servicing their their clients the right way during a lockdown of pandemic and that that right way whatever it is it's different for every community it's different for every industry but you know now <clears throat> through stories from what other people have told you through your own experiences of people reaching out to you checking on you seeing that what they can do for you you know what is resonating as good service and what is resonating as uh, mediocre or not so good service. Yeah, this is the time to take exam. You know, to take take those learnings and, uh, like DJ said, like be that rock star. You know what it takes to be it now, and uh, you know what kind of time you're going to have on your hands if you're stuck at home again. You, you you all you can do is just allocate that time into being that rock star. It's it, you've got the formula. You just got to execute it now. I agree. This is, this is the time. And, and it's a challenging time, too, because agents are probably as busy as ever mm -hmm. right now. So, so we understand that time is, is a bit limited if you're a producing agent. <clears throat> Excuse me, because, of course, uh, things are, have started to return to some sort of normalcy. Mm -hmm. We're seeing at more activity. Uh, we're seeing multiple offer situations on, on many listings. Uh, agents are, you know, money is cheap. Uh, this is a, a, a great time to be uh, uh, to be buying, uh, but a very difficult time to be buying simply because of the low yeah. inventory. So, so you might be really, really busy right now, and that would be a great, wonderful problem to have. Um, but it also is something to think. Okay, well, what happens in three months if we're back down in, in a lockdown? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what can I, can I, can I put a structure in place to, to make sure I have answers for my clients, and and also do I have outreach uh, built into my my daily life so that, you know, I'm staying in touch no matter what happens. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, a piece of advice too, that I, I think this is really interesting. I was talking about this with a realtor um, 
uh, the other day. Uh, this is something that agents can be doing right now to help ensure uh, the kind of the forward momentum of their business. If you are currently working with buyers and sellers right at the moment, um, especially in that active negotiation phase where you've got a property uh, and you're just trying to negotiate the terms that work for everybody. I encourage right now, I'm encouraging realtors to bring into that negotiation an element of let's close as quick as possible and involve a delayed possession date mm. if we if if that is necessary for folks you know I, I think we've all had clients who said you know the, the my clear to close date is on the 15th but i need until the 22nd in order to get my stuff out to get to the next place i can't can't close on my next home until the 22nd so let's delay closing you know what it's just not a good idea right now right. build negotiate your contracts so that you can close as soon as possible and offer some sort of delayed possession if that is necessary. And the reason I suggest that is once the contract, once the ink is on the contract, once the closing is done, your ability to be able to move, you know, your client's ability to be able to move from place to place to get into their new home, that is really on them. They don't have to depend on an institution in order to make that happen. But if you say to you, you know, if you've got a client that says, you know, we've got the clear to close, but let's just push it out by two or three weeks because I need some time to get my ducks in a row here. You may be at the mercy of a closing company that all of a sudden can't offer you a closing. Right. Or you may have to uh, get an appraisal uh, on a property that you no longer have an appraiser available for. And so, you know, right now thinking about your business moving forward you want to get those contracts executed as quickly as possible. Stack all of that stuff up right now when we know we can execute that stuff. And the things like possession, that's the sort of thing that even though it's kind of a pain in the butt sometimes for buyers and sellers to have to deal with each other after the contract has been closed, I guarantee you your clients are, will be much more uh, happy to deal with each other uh, to to trade off keys later on than to not have that option at all. There were many, uh, there were many lenders that were finding, finding it extremely challenging to close uh, by their traditional close dates uh, because of course of the lockdown. Also remember there's a confluence of things going on that we, you know, during lockdown, of course, I just, operationally, it was challenging to get things done in time um, across the board, whether you're a title company or, or a lending institution. It was just difficult. And also, um, we had uh, rates being at, at their lowest in, in a, quite a while. So you had all these people refinancing. Um, so I, another opportunity uh, would be to, con Chris had said this earlier, but just to reiterate, you know, talk to your lenders, talk to your yeah. title company, say, hey, when this happened back April, May, and June, how did that affect uh, you know, you saw probably lots and lots of closings or, or refinances. How did it affect the ability to, to do any of those things? Because if, if we might be heading towards that, uh, I want to make sure my clients are educated so that I can, as Chris said, have a, an intelligent conversation about maybe not waiting to close um, because of here's what happened, you know, just a few months prior. I, I was actually, I have to be a little careful how I, how I describe this. I'm going to be very vague. Um, but I, I was speaking to, I have a friend who works at a company who has a website that um, uh, promotes uh, real estate listings. So I'm just going to keep it as, as simple as that. There's a lot of them. So hundreds of websites that do this. But, but so I, I was talking to a friend who works at one of these companies. And I said, just out of curiosity, I just talked to him the other day. I said, how did that affect your web traffic April, May, and June? What, what did it look like compared to pre-lockdown? Uh, pre and he said, I can't even share with you the numbers. We, we more than doubled our numbers mm. uh, month over month, you know, and, and, and during, during that time. And he said, I, I, he goes, it's so incredible. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. So what, what, what do we, can we take from that is if we go back down into to a lockdown scenario, that's pro likely to happen again, right? We still have rates being low. People are feeling maybe more confined or just looking around their house more and going, maybe it's time for a change. Mm -hmm. This is a great time to remember that. So in the event that, that you know, we, we start becoming less active and either voluntarily or involuntarily staying more at home, 
that those trends will likely continue. And you have this wonderful opportunity to, to reach out to your clients, uh, understanding that so many people are just, maybe they're even just bored and looking either way, uh, that activity's there. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, a great way to just to keep that in mind so you can reach out and, and see how your clients are doing. Yeah. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. A, a good, um, a mentor of mine once told me, um, never be satisfied with, uh, what the press release says, always be satisfied with what the boots on the ground are saying. And so essentially when it, when it comes to real estate, what, what he meant by that was, um, you can read what you can read what the announcement is on a bank's uh, page about their policies and about their uh, timelines, especially in a situation like this. But the best information you're going to get is from the lender who knows you by your first name. And right. so uh, that's something I've, I've done. I've reached out to uh, a lender that I know uh, and am in daily contact with him uh, specifically about how his business is going um, and how things are going just in, in the lending industry in, you know, in general, it's, it's, um, you know, being prepared, uh, and having those connections and, and relationships. If you don't have, if you don't have a favorite lender, if you don't have a preferred lender or inspector or appraiser, you know, you don't have to invite these people to Thanksgiving dinner though, you know, being friendly is a good thing. What you want out of this is you want somebody who is going to answer your text messages because they know that you are interested in their business. Maybe you're giving them some referrals. They are doing the same thing for you. And more often than not, the most valuable thing here is not the occasional client though. That's nice. The most valuable thing here is the information and the insight that you're going to get. Yeah. And, and it, you know, knowledge is power. I, I know that's uh, an overused expression, but boy, is it, it's so important because, you know, I think real estate professionals, uh, myself included, I'm really, I, I don't really consider myself that much entrenched in, in the real estate industry. Um, however, uh, we have 700 agents here at our own firm who uh, I'm always asking, how are things going? What, what's working? What's not working for you? But understanding that, that the top agents I know have answers to, well, okay, if we go back into lockdown, what, what's going to happen? Or what did we see happen last time? They already know the answer to that. And mm -hmm. if you find yourself not knowing those answers, okay, great. That's honest. That's fine. Now's the time to, to develop that, that skill set. Talk to top agents, um, you know, talk to top producers uh, and just sit them down or talk to your managing broker or whoever can help you or their local association um, because your clients are going to be searching this stuff. And especially if we go back into lockdown, they're going to be looking up these answers as well. And you don't want them to be more educated than you. And, and uh, that's a really important thing when they're paying you a most cases, a very sizable amount of money. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was, I had, I'll, I'll <laughs> I don't know how it works in Michigan with, with earnest money um, or if that's a, a big thing in Michigan. It's, it's very popular here in, in Illinois or in Chicago land at least. And I, <laughs> I, some, somebody, uh, not one of our agents, although I, maybe our agents do this too. I hope they don't. Um, but uh, somebody came by to drop off an earnest money check. And it mm -hmm. was the client and it wasn't the client's agent. And they dropped it off at our office. And uh, the client, of course, well, you know, we just assume everyone understands that process and what it's for and why, why it happens. And client was really clueless. And we don't even, we don't even accept earnest money here uh, at, our, at our company. So that made it even more difficult because then I had to tell the, uh, the, the buyer, hey, I'm really sorry. Um, I think your agent might have given you the wrong information. We, we don't have it. And, and I was just thinking, you know, as they were leaving, and I'm not trying to be critical and I don't know who that agent was, but I thought, you know, if I was getting two and a half percent to help somebody buy or whatever that amount he or she was getting, um, I'd probably swing by and grab, get that check and not say, hey, Mr. Buyer, or Miss, go ahead and drop that off over here. Yeah, no but, kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, I'm, and I, look, for other agents that if that process works for you, great. But, um, you know, you're getting paid handsomely and, and you should have knowledge, you should have answers. Uh, and now's the time to develop those and, and look back to your processes as well. And then mm -hmm. think about, you know, what are things you can improve upon? Um, anything else, Chris, anything else on your mind? Yeah, you know, the only other thing I think this has been kind of a, re uh, a revolving theme for me in the last uh, two weeks here is this idea that, um, COVID-19 and the pandemic that we're experiencing 
uh, and the effects of that pandemic have not necessarily been a major pivot in our business or, or business at whole. It's, it's been an accelerant. It's, it has been Mm -hmm. a moment where we have made something like, you know, we're, we're, we're advancing, um, you know, client expectations, opportunities, uh, and our businesses by 10 years in the span of, of something like 10 weeks. And so something I'm telling agents right now is I, it's important. Everyone should be thinking about what their business looks like 10 years from now. Think about what you look like as a professional in 10 years. Where do you want to be? Where, what, what sort of clients do you want to be servicing? What sort of business do you want to be doing? How do you want to be spending your time? And the reason that I'm making this suggestion to folks is clients, our, our clients, our buyers and our sellers and our communities have in the last two months here, three months here, they have realized a lot more of what they are depending on agents for is something that they can do from their couch. And that's not necessarily a bad thing for us in our industry, but it is an eye opener that says, you know what, our, this, this, this uh, customer education, which typically happens slowly over the course of years, happened in weeks. And so we need to be accelerating our business plans uh, accordingly. We need to be thinking, okay, this is what our customer expectations are. Where, where, how do I match those? How do I accelerate my business right now? Uh, and so I'm encouraging folks, not just in their business, but in their personal life, where, where, look at where you are right now, where, where, where do you expect to be in 10 years? Where do you want to be in 10 years? These are the priorities we should start setting right now because the world is moving very quickly, much as in business and in real estate, much faster than it was three or four months ago. And so if you want to keep up with that, you got to have that accelerated mindset. That's great. Keep an accelerated mindset. I love that. I mean, I, while you were talking about, I was thinking about my own personal life and, and thinking about my, my physical being. I, I got really sick. Um, uh, thankfully, not, not from COVID, uh, just simple food poisoning about four months ago, uh, right when all this was really starting. And, and I was laying there just feeling miserable. I, I had about three or four days where it was really rough. And I was laying there and I realized the previous five years, I, I thought back five years, and I, I had this vision of, of where I wanted my physical health to look like and, 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 and what I, how I wanted to feel. And I realized um, as I was laying there very sickly, uh, which was not my fault, I just ate some bad food that, that was delivered to me. But um, I realized that uh, aside from that, um, I said, you know, I'm not in the physical shape I, I, I thought I would be in five years ago, uh, you know, today. And so I thought, okay, five years, or in your case, your, your, your example, 10 years, it's going to come. <laughs> 10 years is going to happen. And, and the question is, you know, it's going, you know, where do you want it to be? And, and, and really starting to make a, 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 an actionable plan that's doable and achievable. And for ev- not everyone also wants, not everybody wants to be a top producer as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, we have on Ryan, uh, Ryan D'April, who, uh, who's from D'April Properties, and he, he has hundreds and hundreds of agents. And he talks about, he has agents that um, their goal is to, uh, you, you know, service a certain number of clients a year. They make around $300,000 or so. And um, he's always encouraging them to get to the next level. And he's learned over, over years. He says, you know, not everybody wants to, that's a very uh, sizable amount of income. And, you know, sometimes that, you know, wh- whatever that amount is for you, it doesn't mean in 10 years, you, you have to be a, a top 1% producer. Maybe that's not your goal. Maybe your goal is to help a certain number of people per year, you know, with your business and, and let the sort of chips fall where they may that's a goal. So, so, you know, you don't, I, I'm not, I, my goal for my physical being isn't to have, you know, 8% body fat and, and chiseled abs and that I don't care. Um, but I want more energy. Mm-hmm. And I know that if I want more energy in my life, I'm going to have to do things um, because five years, 10 years is going to arrive. And, and what I'm doing today is really, really important um, as opposed to, you know, another five years going by and I get sick again and have time to reflect on my physical health. And I'm like, what am I doing? Mm. Um, so, so good time, as Chris said, to, to think of that accelerant mindset is, is where do you want to be in 10 years? Um, perfect way to, to, to cap our, our conversation. So um, Chris, once again, I, I want to encourage all of our listeners right now, 
stop what you're doing unless you're driving, keep driving, <laughs> uh, don't, or, or pull over, uh, but go to theclothes.com. Th this is legitimately our favorite uh, uh, real estate uh, marketing website. I, I wish I would have thought of it. Uh, and it, it would be a great way to promote this podcast if I would have come up with it. Uh, but I didn't, but the clothes did and they're awesome. And they come out with just a handful of articles a week and they're very, very well uh, written. They're intentional. They're researched. Um, you know, sometimes you, you, you go on, uh, I've gone online and, and done searches like best marketing tips for realtors. And you come across these lists of a hundred things you can do. And 98 of the hundred are really like not that interesting or exciting or all that helpful. The close doesn't do that. They do have lists, but their lists are amazing, but mm -hmm. they also, you know, do other types of pieces as well. So definitely check out the close.com also subscribe to their pro option. Mm -hmm. um, again, a free 14 day trial, nothing to lose. And, and you'll get, you know, guidance from people like Chris, uh, along with all their editors and contributors. It's an amazing organization. We're, we're super proud uh, to be affiliated with them for this, uh, to have them on the show uh, and, and super grateful. So Chris, on behalf of the, the viewers and the listeners, um, once again, thank you for continuing to come on our show and, and spend time out of your incredibly busy day. Chris is by the way, Chris is not only, you know, has a family and, and does, uh, you know, uh, fishing we talked about and, and, and is an actor, but also is a real estate professional himself and a trainer, a coach, as well as a journalist. So he is a busy, busy guy. So we are so thrilled uh, to have you. And, um, you know, we're going to continue to uh, to keep asking you back. So uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Chris. And um, we're going to ask everybody real quickly, two quick things we always cap or end with, which is please tell a friend, think of one other real estate agent that could benefit from listening to this particular interview with Chris from the close and uh, send them a link to our podcast. The easiest way, just shoot them over to our, our uh, website, keepingitrealpod.com. Um, also, you can find us on any podcast app. So just look for Keeping It Real. You'll see us. Uh, there's a bunch of Keeping It Real podcasts, by the way, which was a silly thing I should have looked at five years ago when I named this. Uh, but you'll find ours if you look. You'll, you'll see us. And uh, also, please follow us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com forward slash Keeping It Real pod. We also post all the things the, the clothes writes there as well. So uh, you can read all the clothes stuff right on our, uh, on our Facebook page. And also follow the clothes on Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash the clothes spelled out D-O-T, C O M. So the clothes.com. So, or just search for the clothes. You'll find them on there and there they have great content there as well. So Chris, thanks again. And, um, this is the 4th of July weekend. So, um, for everyone watching live as we're recording this happy 4th of July, everyone listening after the fact, will go, why are they saying this? That was a week ago. So I apologize to our, uh, all of our listeners, but for our viewers, it is 4th of July and, um, hope everyone has a safe and healthy holiday. Uh, as also you as well, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me back. Look forward to talking again soon. Great.